when you put a house on the market, one of two things happens. Either you are selling your house with the furniture in it, or you actually have moved and you've left an empty house. Now, if you still live in the house and your real estate agent is really, really honest with you, what they will do is they will say, can we make a few suggestions? And they walk through your home and they start nodding their head and checking things off. What they're basically saying is delete, delete, delete. Get rid of those pictures, simplify, make it look more basic. If you're already out, then they bring in stagers and they, they literally stage your house. Some of them even put out plates to so somehow make you believe that they're really going to be a, a home for you. John Kelly and his wife went through that recently and he wrote an article in the Washington Post I was intrigued by. John, like many of us, said I was of the out of sight, out of mind school. You know about that, don't you? You grew up in that. You grew up knowing that God made dressers and closets for you and I to stuff things. And as long as it's out of sight, it is in fact out of mind. So we spend a lot of time getting that stuff put away. But his wife insisted. If you read the article, you'll see that. But the part that I wanted you to see today is the beginning of that article has a great picture on it. <clears throat> and it reminded me of myself. How many of you even know what that is? You know, I know, you got gray hair, you know what that is. <clears throat> I would challenge any of you who have a car that was probably... Uh, over 20 years, you know, maybe about 2,000, that has a cassette player in it. Probably not, unless you put it in yourself. But he went through those. I mean, does your heart not beat because he, those are ones that he actually recorded and put the, put, his, put the songs on there. Now, for those young folks out here who don't have any idea what that is, he actually put those things in this player and they played music for us. And so there he found himself not knowing what to do. But more and more, we are getting in to what we have called death cleaning. It comes from a Swedish word. You're going to see the word on the screen in a few moments. And I have practiced and practiced and practiced my best Swedish accent on this. Der stingning is the way it's supposed to be pronounced. Der stingning. And that word literally means do or death and uh, stagning is the cleaning. So death cleaning. Now before any of you get morbid about this, uh, you can do death cleaning long before you think about death. I mean, anytime you're making a transition in your life, you're downsizing, you're doing something different with your life, there is all kinds of transitions. This week I visited a hospital where there was a person into this world that was brought. You saw a picture of Easton a moment ago. And then I left and went to another room that was in SICU, surgical intensive care, and I looked at a classmate of mine who was completely unconscious from a wreck that he had coming down Taylor Mill Hill on Monday. And then yesterday I stood up on behalf of a family whose 85-year-old patriarch has passed. And so in the midst of all that, I kept thinking about this death thing, you know, this death cleaning thing. Each of those will have some cleansing to do. The Maddox household will never be the same after that child comes home. And the other home, the Price family, they will never be the same after the patriarch has died. There will be differences. There will be changes. There will be a kind of cleaning that happens. Margaret Magnuson wrote in an article, for me, me, this death cleaning means going through all my belongings and, ha and deciding how to get rid of the things that I do not want anymore. For those of us who 
cling on to things a little more than others. And I know some of you are looking at me and you're thinking, Dan, you have prepared this message just for me. No, Sherry, I did not prepare this just for you. <laughs> I could not miss that. All week long, I knew, I said, should I warn Sherry or should I, you know, not? But I, I love her so much, I just had to do that. But she said, when that happens, when we begin to, to let that happen, it, it's definitely time that something uh, begins to transition. Okay, so let's, we've got our folders. Let's follow along. How to remove sinful actions and attitudes. What is it in this death cleaning process that Jesus talks about in the passage that we read earlier that helps us to know about this death cleaning, this transitioning, this removing things in our hearts and our lives that bring about um, a kind of uh, maturation, if you would. Well, let's go back to the scripture. Jesus said, teacher, or the person said, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. And notice what's happened. John is concerned, that's the person speaking, that this unknown exorcist is not properly trained or he's not properly authorized to be doing this. And so Jesus makes note, do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. And then he says an interesting sentence. He says, whoever is not against us is for us. In other words, if they're not doing harm to us, let them be. God can still work in them. Let's talk about that a little, little bit. Does this action or this attitude that I have in my heart, does this action or attitude that you have in your heart move you closer to the heartbeat and the presence of God, or does it move you further away? That's the simple question everybody needs to ask when they talk about transition in their life, when they talk about cleaning some things out, when they talk about refocusing their lives. That's the question. That's the one that we walk around. Does this action, does this attitude move me closer or further away from the presence and the power of God? So, next movement, delete your concern for purity. And I know this is, this one you have to walk around it three times. Let's, let's get into it. Get rid of it. In other words, Whoever is not against us and the way of Jesus is for us. In other words, don't get so hypersensitive about your religion, and I would add to that, about your politics. We live at a time when we want purity of our particular belief system. Let me give you a couple of examples. Well, politics, I'm not even going to worry about. I think everybody knows about that. But in religion, <clears throat> I mentioned it to you several months ago, and I'm going to make only a probably a 60 second thing about it but this week I will likely be asked to go and speak to a group of people at the Kentucky Baptist Convention on behalf of a stupid decision that they have made now I probably won't call it stupid to them but I will say this is not a good decision that you've made as a convention because basically what it does is that it says all of us you don't, maybe you don't know that. But you are a part of a church who has a long history, before I came, in case anybody wants to blame me, long history of being much more open-minded than a lot of Baptist churches. And one of the things that we do here is that we, um, we associate with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship and the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. So in our dual connection, the KBC, the Kentucky Baptist Convention, is saying, we don't want you associating with them anymore. They've made a decision that they, that they don't like, so we don't want you associating with them. So if you, in fact, associate with them, we're going to kick you out. Well, I think that's crazy. <laughs> I don't know of another state convention in all of America that's doing that. And the Southern Baptist Convention is not even doing that. So I've been asked with a couple of other pastors to go and talk to them, and see if we can move from it. I thought of this the other day when, I don't know if you've seen, the, there's a documentary out. It's called American Creed. What I like about it is it takes the issue of politics. You're going to see the couple people that are involved in here. Condoleezza Rice and David Kennedy are people who you, you would, you know, besides the fact that they're not politically uh, the same by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but they're doing this documentary, and I read through it and some of the topics that they're discussing. And what I, I came away with was some hope, you know. 
there's some people talking about some things that are hot button issues, but they're trying not to have total purity. In other words, this is the way I believe, this is the way you ought to believe, and you're wrong if you don't believe this way. And so they're having a discussion. Let me quote Condoleezza Rice for you. We all have to start listening to each other. And right now we're shouting at each other instead. Right now we're saying my grievance or my narrative or my story is superior to yours. And I've suffered more and I've been more discriminated against. Whew. I mean, it just gets so heavy sometimes. What she's saying is we need to take a step back. We need to begin listening to each other and stop yelling at each, at each other and that's where I, when you read Jesus, whoever's not against us is for us. Just bring it down, bring the volume, and listen to each other. The next two things are really the things that do with this whole issue of um, cleaning. And it says if, you have been, if you're involved in the cleaning process of your life, you'll do a couple of things. First of all, you will do the right thing. Verse 43 and 45 goes like this. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell with an unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble and cut it off, it is better for you to enter life and, and uh, lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. Now, the word cause you to stumble is an interesting word. It's, it's uh, the Greek word is scandalizo, and it means a scandal. So if something, if you're doing something that scandalizes somebody, that causes them to stumble, that causes them um, to not like you because of your language or your, uh, your hypocrisy, it, it scandalizes them. And so what kind of things does that include? Well, one of the things that I found interesting in all my reading this week was a person said that basically their purchasing had gotten them so uh, out of kilter that they decided not to shop for a year. Now, I read the article. I don't know what that exactly meant, except that I think they just didn't shop for it once. They did needs, obviously, but they didn't shop for one. So she says in the article, she says, it doesn't take long for the craving to subside, be it for Winston's or Gin's or Cupcakes, is the way she began the article. I got the hang of giving shopping up. It wasn't much of a trick. And then this is the line that I thought. The trickier part was living with the startling abundance that had come because glaring obvious when I stopped trying to get more. The other night, and I, I kidded Sherry a moment ago. I'm going to kid her again. Uh, I watched Sherry the other night. Sherry uh, was, Sherry always makes her way when we do the feeding of the homeless. I make my way around, and, but a lot of our members have gotten to where they go, and they'll sit down, and they'll talk with somebody. And, they'll, and I watched Sherry. She had talked to a couple people, but then I noticed she was, her eyes were locked in on a young man, and she was almost pleading with him. And I watched it as it took place, and then I saw her coming in my direction. She wanted to tell me what had just happened, and uh, the young man had talked about suicide. And it wasn't but about five minutes or so that he turns and just the last minute just takes off. So I and she go into kind of our mode and we contact James, the guy that runs the place. And he catches him at the corner and just begins to talk to him. And sure enough, he got him to come back and uh, Sherry took food to him. And I will just tell you, there was something powerful about that. Now, I don't know where he is today and what he's gone through, but there was a man who felt at the end of his hope and there was somebody trying to help him bridge that gap. I grew up in a store. Mom had a store and she always had little candies and things. She had a whole slew and, and kids, I would remember watching kids come in and the first thing I would do is get them a little candy bag out. And they'd start dropping their candy in that bag. And, of course, I was the human register. Five cents, ten cents, fifteen cents. I counted that as it was going into that candy bag. Do you, would you ever believe that sometimes people wanted to kind of do this? And not pay for it? Did I tell you my mom carried a thirty-eight in her purse? I don't know if I told you that. <laughs> no. 
Have you ever stole something and when you thought about it, you said, oh, my hand made me do it? No, really, you didn't, did you? You did something. Uh, Nadia Ropes Weber is a woman preacher who talks about stealing candy when she was a child. Stole it from Kmart of all places. I think she said she was 11 years old. And she hid that candy on a heat dust, a heat dust duct in her room. Not a good place to, to, put, to put your candy. And she said it wasn't long after that that she heard somebody speak about this passage. <laughs> and so she realized then, you know, my hand had nothing to do with it. My feet had nothing to do with it. My heart had everything to do with it. And I would say that's the truth. What is the difference between an enlarged heart and a shrinking heart? A shrinking heart doesn't listen very much, just focuses on its own needs. But an enlarged heart consistently looks around and says, God, what are you asking me to do? Where are you asking me to go? What are you asking me to see? And that's our last point here. See the right things. Jesus says that if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. And it's better to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two that will be thrown into hell. We live in a visual culture. Never before have you, can you see more in less time than you can today. Never more. And you can have any level of pornography on your phone in a heartbeat if you choose that. If you are on Twitter or if you are on many of the social platforms, it will come your direction whether you ask for it or not. I had an invitation from a lady in Florida yesterday who said, I like older men. <laughs> and I didn't answer. I'm sitting there thinking, how am I going to delete this, you know, what, whatever, and it, it comes back. I didn't mean to... Um, to hurt your feelings. I'm thinking, is she in the room? Or where is she? Just so you don't worry, I took care of that and shut that account off. But we can see things almost anywhere if we choose to. Desk cleaning. Remember the movie 127 Hours? If you haven't seen it, you need to. You'll see the front of it there. But what you don't know is it is, in fact, based upon a true story of a 27-year-old man, Ralston, who finds himself trapped in a canyon for 127 hours. Now, what you don't know is that that movie is based upon a true-life book by this man. And it's entitled Between a Rock and a Hard Place. And he literally was hanging, and he had to cut his own arm off to get free. It is a chilling movie. Obviously, he made it out, but oh my goodness. But if you read the book and you get close to it, he says this. Looking back, basically, this is what got him through. The love of others, the relationships of family and friends, and a dependence on them. He says in his book, well, God is love, and love is what kept me alive, and that love is what got me out of there. Now, I would not suggest any of us do anything so radical or get ourselves into a situation, but when you look back at his life, you found out that there was a, a bit of independence in him that got him in that situation. You are not supposed to go do what he was doing by yourself. You never do what he was doing. Of all weeks, I met a man this week who told me about rock climbing, and he fell. And if he had not been with other people, he'd been doing it for years, but he was goofing off and doing something he shouldn't have done, and it was people there. He broke 13 ribs, and they had to life flight him. But he would have died if it had not been for others. And then there's that the little phrase there I mentioned to you. Every, everyone will be salted with fire. Back in those days, the early New Testament days, what were the two preservatives? There was salt, and there was fire. And those two preservatives were intended to do, do exactly that, preserve. When Neva and I moved 
we found out what happens when you have children in this next generation. We had saved all these pictures. I had taken Nicholas to camp and we had won, you know, awards, mainly me because I was such a stud, but I mean, you know, it was father, son, and I, I helped him out a little bit along the way. I hope all of you know that's not true. Um, but we had these awards and things that we had done together. And so, you know, I, with trembling hand, I, I went to my son and I said, son, where do you want to keep these? Where do you want to keep these? He said, dad, I don't want those things. Now, does that mean he didn't love the experience? Absolutely not. It means that there's stuff that what mattered was the memory. What was mattered, we did it. What mattered was, and so I threw them away. No, I didn't. You know they're still in the garage in my house. You know that. <laughs> I'm not going to give those up. But it helped me understand that, you know, what matters is the memory. What matters is the moment. What matters is how we are connected together. When I stood with this family yesterday, it was not, not that, the, that the patriarch had died, it was what he had done with them when he was with them. And that's church, and that's life, and that's love, and that's hope, and that's God. He doesn't give us a little cross to carry around and say, this will, this will be everything. He just says, carry me in your heart. Carry me in your heart. Let's pray together. Father, when we read that text, it seems so radical that we would do something radical in order to be fully committed to you. And yet, we do need to do something radical. And what that radical thing is, is to give our hearts to you. And so, every Sunday, we walk through singing songs that will help make us brave. Singing songs that will challenge the opportunity that we have before us. And today is that day. Today we are going to sing yet another song and walk yet another aisle to make sure that it is in fact well with our soul. So be with us in what we share and do in these next few minutes in Christ's name. Amen. If you're here and you haven't accepted Christ that you'd like to and you've never perhaps done it personally but you've never done it publicly, perhaps you say I want to be a part of this fellowship, whatever it might be. We are here for you, and we'd love to walk through you. I know that uh, Donna is going to come forward. We're going to lay hands on her. So as Donna comes, and uh, we lay, if you want to be a part of that experience, uh, Donna's having uh, some tests and some possible things going on, and we just need to lay hands on Donna and uh, pray for her in just a few moments. So if she'd like to come down, feel free if you want to come down and fellowship. Let's stand together and sing.